and welcome to our session on higher ed in the era of COVID. I um, want to make sure you can see us and hear us okay. So if you can, I want you to write in the chat, share an emoji um, that describes your current mood. And as you're doing that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Letha, who's going to kick us off and give us some introductions for today. Great. Thanks a lot, Nick. And uh, welcome. I'm Letha Filderman, the president of PopTech. And uh, I'm I'm delighted to uh, have all of you join us today for what promises to be a provocative and timely conversation on the future of higher education in the uh, era of the COVID pandemic. Um, we put this session together and it, it, you know, it wasn't hard to do because I have to say one of the most popular talks of PopTech 2019 was actually a session that uh, both Mariko uh, and Fred participated in on the future of higher education long before we knew that a uh, massive uh, global pandemic was about to hit. And I, I went back and listened to their talks and I have to say, I, I think they, they had a lot of interesting comments that sort of served as a bit of a foreshadow of, of where we are now. And I'm very anxious to hear uh, where they think we're going to be going in the next, uh, I, maybe it's not a few months, uh, maybe a few years and even a few decades. So I'm delighted and I, I don't think we can have three better people uh, at the helm of this conversation who I'd like to introduce uh, quickly. So uh, Marco Silver is the president of the Henry Luce Foundation, which was founded by Henry Luce, uh, the co-founder and editor of, ed editor in chief of Time Magazine. Uh, and the foundation conducts grant making in leadership programs in Asia, higher education, religion and theology, art and public policy. Prior to uh, her tenure at the Luce Foundation, uh, Mariko was the president of Bennington College. And I, I believe she was the youngest person to ever take on that role um, and those reigns and just accomplished an amazing body of work in her term there and was recognized for her writings on experiential learning, the future of work and diversity and leadership. Prior to her um, time at Bennington, she served as the assistant, acting assistant secretary for international affairs and deputy assistant secretary for international policy in the US Department of Homeland, Homeland Security under President Obama. So phew, quite a list of accomplishments there and uh, just a, an amazing wealth of of wisdom that she's gonna to bring to the conversation. Um, equally uh, impressive in, and uh, when I look at the, just in the, I've, I've known Fred for about probably 15 years now, give or take. And um, it, what he's accomplished in that time is just truly astonishing. So Fred is the co-founder of the African Leadership Group, which is an ecosystem of organizations that aim to catalyze a generation of an entrepreneurial African leaders. And I believe that they have a really uh, kind of low level goal, low key, uh, 3 million leader, African leaders uh, by 2035, I believe. So, um, and I think he'll actually accomplish it since I've never known Fred not to accomplish a goal he set out to, to do. Um, Fred's a world economic young global leader, uh, a fellow of Echoing Green and the Aspen Institute. And in 2019, he was recognized uh, by Time Magazine as one of the most, um, uh, I, I would just have to say one of the most innovative and entrepreneurial people in the world. So um, I think we're gonna have a wonderful conversation with two people who are iconic in the world of higher ed. And I'm delighted to uh, introduce my, my dear colleague and friend, Nick Martin, as the moderator of this session. Nick is an educator and entrepreneur and, and has just done amazing work at Tech Change, which he founded, I don't know what, about 10 years ago now, Nick, give or take. And uh, yeah. that uh, Tech Change is a DC-based social enterprise providing online tech training that focuses on positive social change around the world. He's an adjunct uh, faculty member at Georgetown and George, George Washington University, where he teaches grad courses for social change using technology tools. Um, he's also a PopTech Social Innovation Fellow and uh, a member of our board. So I'm delighted to have all of you with us, and I'm looking forward to the conversation. So thank you. 
Nick, I'm going to turn it over to yeah. you. Thank you, Letha. So, Fred and Mariko, um, I was in the audience when we had that great uh, session with you all at Point Lookout last year. Um, Mariko, you spoke about increasing inequalities in higher ed. You talked about prohibitive costs. We had some reflections on the varsity blues scandal. That was the one where the parents were paying for their kids to get into college. That feels like decades ago. Um, the individual aspirations we all have for college versus thinking about things and, and themes and, and, and um, ideas larger than ourselves for the collective benefit. And Fred, you spoke about regulations, culture, and costs being very challenging to navigate in your journey, um, but also the importance of lifelong learning and learning by doing. Um, so you both asked the question when we, when we convened in 2019, what do we want out of college as an institution? And we also uh, heard from you about what college might look like five and 30 years in the future. What an amazing conversation to return to given the current context. Um, I looked at a, an Economist article, came out a couple days ago that looked at COVID uh, and the effects it's having on universities. Many of you watching are probably living this right now, but uh, no surprises, right? Campuses are breeding grounds for the virus. Many higher education institutions are cutting staff. Enrollments are down, uh, especially among international students uh, here in the United States, but we'll hear about how that's affecting some of the, the, the global contexts. Buildings and projects are on hold. And according to um, some data collected at Davidson College, less than a quarter of universities will teach fully or mostly in person. So everyone's trying to figure out um, what exactly online uh, and hybrid learning will mean for their, uh, for their student experience. So um, our format for today is I'm gonna ask three questions to each uh, uh, Mariko and Fred, general bucket questions. Then I'm gonna have them each ask a question to each other. Then we're going to open it up for you all to ask some questions. So we'll try and leave about half an hour at the end uh, to do that. Um, as we go, if you do have questions, feel free to ask them in the chat and I will do my best to weave them in. Um, okay, so let us shift to the first question here. And um, Marika, I will start with you. Uh, you um, spent quite a bit of time in 2019 talking about the sort of existential questions around why we need higher ed. And, and, and so maybe you could uh, for our, for our, the benefit of starting here, um, share with us what we mean or what you think of when we say college or higher ed, and, and is college necessary for everyone? So if I could, Nick, I'm going to just turn that a little bit and say, you know, in 2019, I would say we already were in the midst of a slow rolling earthquake. Lots of people have written about how uh, COVID and uh, all kinds of events, including the killing of George Floyd in the last a uh, few months have accelerated change on a number of levels. Uh, some people say it's good, some people say it's bad, we'll leave that to the side for the moment. I think we're entering into at least a decade of significant uncertainty. There will be pockets of stability because uh, humans can't function any other way, but significant uncertainty. So when we ask what we want out of higher ed, I think we have to ask ourselves over the next decade, both what would we want to change about our premises and understanding about higher ed, or as now the Mellon Foundation calls it, higher learning, um, because higher ed talks about a sector, higher learning talks about a process. So I think the question of what do we want out of higher learning? Uh, what kinds of structures do we need to make available and to whom uh, to accomplish those goals? What are the societal goals? You know, We've often talked about what are the goals for higher ed, but what are the societal goals that we ought to have for higher ed? Um, and what are the ways in which we can both use this period of uncertainty, but also try to help to the best of our ability as a, as a human society, make sure that we don't exit this 10 years with more trauma than we entered with. We entered with a lot of trauma already, right? But we, that, that as a society, we don't, ent we don't exit this 10 years as a fundamentally fear-based society. And now I'm not just talking about the US, but I'm talking from a US perspective as a fundamentally fear-based society rather than as a fundamentally creative and generative-based society. So I would kind of zoom us way up uh, beyond higher ed and say, what do we want as a society? If we want creative and generative engagement that is mo far more equitable than it has been in the past, far more inclusive than it has been in the past, then we have to work backwards from there and say, therefore our higher learning mechanisms and institutions should look like X, Y, Z. And I think I'd start from the premise that there is no single answer. 
I think one of the great, and I mentioned this at the PopTech talk uh, last year, one of the great benefits of the US system, the one I know the best, is that it's not a system qua system, right? It's an ecosystem, there's a lot of diversity, institutional type opportunity. Um, now I'm talking only about the nonprofit sector, the for-profit sector I'll put to the side uh, for the moment. We can talk about it if people want to, but I think there are fundamentally different dynamics at play. Uh, and the evidence is that there's, there are fundamentally different dynamics at play. So I'm talking squarely about the non-for-profit sector. Um, and I think we would do ourselves a great disservice uh, and we would do the world a great disservice given how many people come from all over the world to US institutions as researchers and students and faculty. We would do the world a great disservice if we were to narrow our vision to particular types of institutions. Um, I also think there are a number of um, sort of binaries and battles uh, that are, as you say in the government, OBE, overtaken by events, right? The question of whether online learning could ever be as good as in-person learning, we have to figure out ways to also make it as good as and complementary to in-person learning. We can't afford to just kind of like hunker down and say it's this way or that way or it's my way or the highway. Um, I think other binaries that, and battles that need to be kind of left by the wayside, probably replaced by other ones, but left by the wayside, um, are questions about you know, degrees versus stacked credentials. Uh, we need to be much more nimble in our thinking and much less bound uh, by our own experiences uh, and projecting our own needs, wants, and desires into a future that will be so unlike the past that we're foolhardy to think that we can shape it. Thank you, Mariko. There's so much in there to unpack and I'm, I'm really grateful for that framing and great to hear you say things like we need, we need to be pushing ourselves as a, as a collective to get more out of online and, and to really kind of embrace that rather than just give up on Zoom after the two months that we had to figure it out. And so Fred, over to you, when you think about the purpose of higher ed, um, how can you kind of build on what Mariko shared and take us a bit deeper in this conversation? So I think uh, it's important to, in my mind, uh, we need to think about uh, the purpose of higher education uh, from multiple perspectives. One is uh, the impact that it has on society. And, you know, in terms of creating new knowledge, uh, disseminating knowledge through research, et cetera, which has historically been one function. And I think a very important function. So many new discoveries and, you know, our lives have been improved because uh, of brilliant minds coming together and creating new and pushing the bound, the, really the, bound, the, the frontiers of, of um, of, uh, of, of human uh, you know, potential and, 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 and innovation, et cetera. So that's one thing which I think is very important and we shouldn't forget as we think about the future of higher education, et cetera. But then there's a second question around, you know, does everyone need to go to college in terms, no, that's, um, in terms of what it does in, in developing human potential and, and, and enabling young people at a certain stage in their life to find pathways to success. And uh, for that dimension of it, I believe that um, one danger that um, has emerged in, in society over, over, over the last few, few decades is that, um, you know, there's, um, you know, I, I would say you know, college has been in some ways over glamorized. Um, and, and the, the you know, societal stigma has been created that, you know, if you haven't gone to college, then you haven't fulfilled your full potential. Um, and uh, it's used as a measure of progress in, in certain societies. Um, and, you know, what fraction of people from this sector make it to college, et cetera. So it's seen as, as, as a status symbol, um, you know, go to college or bust. And, um, and we're not necessarily asking the question about does every person need this to be successful in life, which is really the question that I think we should be asking uh, for, for young people. You know, so if you look at the fully residential Ivy League or liberal arts college or, you know, that, 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 ex that experience where you go away for four years and you live uh, in a dormitory away from home, et cetera, um, that experience is amazing. You know, I went to a small liberal arts college in Minnesota, McAllister College. I wouldn't give, I would, I wouldn't give that experience up for anything. Um, but... Uh, you know, it's, it's in a way, it's, it's a fabulous luxury product. You know, it's like you're buying a Lamborghini or a fancy house. It's wonderful <laughs> if you can afford it, right? Um, you know, you can take four years off of, of your life to, um, to have a, some, some, some leisure. It's, it's a chance to grow up 
a uh, chance to expand, yeah, enhance your network, maybe learn a few things. Uh, but just like the Lamborghini, if you, can't, if you cannot afford it, then it becomes a noose around your neck and you go into debt and there's no guarantee of success, et cetera. So if you are in a stage of life where you don't have the means, then we really need to question whether going through college um, and paying for it yourself um, is, is in the way it's designed today um, is really a worthwhile trade-off. Um, you know, are there alternatives to get you know, quicker results? Um, something that's more relevant to your purpose and needs in life. And if you ask those questions, you realize, I know, um, college is not always the pathway that gets you to where your destination, what, what you actually want to, to achieve for yourself. Um, and so I think what we need to really be talking about to, to, be, to is to break, um, you know, this uh, monopoly of pathways that, that college has somehow grabbed and say, it's okay if you decide to become an entrepreneur straight out of, out of high school and perhaps, you know, there's a six month program that, that enables you to do that. Or it's okay if you, um, you know, want to, um, you know, uh, work for two, for, for two years and then, and then do something else. Um, you know, we need to think about, uh, you know, systems like you see in Germany and in Switzerland where there are many, many different pathways um, where you, not everyone goes to college, right? Singapore does the same thing. So um, the real fundamental question we should be asking is, what do young people want to achieve in life? How do they want to be successful? What impact do they want to have? And then really question whether college is giving them that, 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 that pathway to their, to their dreams. And if not, then you shouldn't go to college. Yeah, I think that takes us so nicely, Fred, to our next big bucket, which is the sort of the business models and the financial side. Um, this luxury good, as you describe it. Uh, and uh, Mariko, I'm going to come back to you. So in your 2019 PubTech talk, you talked a lot about the growing inequalities uh, that, that exist in the higher ed landscape. You talked about how college is becoming prohibitively expensive for a uh, vast majority of, of students in the United States. Uh, and yet there are all, all kinds of other types of, of higher ed institutions that are serving um, uh, different types of students at different income levels. How do you see the business models being disrupted now that we are in the midst of COVID? What, what new additions or insights can you add to this conversation given where we are today? So I think I'll just uh, riff a little bit off of what Fred said, which is, you know, I think we shouldn't think about college, right? As I said at the beginning of my pop tech talk last year, like what do you think of when you think of college? But we think of college as a certain kind of unit, a closed system. Um, rather than, you know, as I mentioned before, higher learning and what is it that people need? Obviously, and this is a whole other conversation, the questions about what college should deliver are not disconnected from the questions about what K-12 education should deliver. And if you just kind of plop college on top of a K-12 system um, that doesn't enable people to uh, depart the K-12 system and move directly into the kinds of pathways that uh, Fred described entrepreneurship and so forth, then you, 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 have a, you have a disjuncture and a problem there too. So just want to kind of lay a marker down uh, about that. And then talking about college as a kind of floating idea uh, is I think not, uh, not, and not enormously productive, which I think Fred did a beautiful job of explaining um, how we can't, why we can't think about it as a kind of floating entity. But the conversation, certainly in the United States, tends to think of college as like this thing hanging out over here as opposed to something that's related to society or related to the K-12 experience. Um, so in terms of disruption, uh, as I said before, I think that you know, a lot of the binaries and the battlegrounds have shifted uh, and rightly so away from the you know, online versus in-person as the only uh, argument worth having or away from degrees versus stack credentials and away hopefully from traditional college age students versus uh, lifelong learners or versus uh, later in life learners. Um, so, you know, there, there was a, a project at, um, at Stanford at the D school where they talked about open loop learning and the idea that you would be able to move in and out of lear learning institutions over the course of your lifetime. And I think as a society, we could ask ourselves the question, right? If that's what we want, have we set up the system to do that? And what would it look like to set up the system so that the question is not, does everyone need to go to college, but how does everybody have the opportunities they need over the course of their lifetime to engage in structured learning? Um, so with that in mind, uh, I think COVID opens up some, uh, obviously some uh, really negative <laughs> pathways, but also some opportunities to rethink 
to rethink some of that. Now that colleges can see, traditional colleges uh, um, can see that you know it's possible that the freshman year not only is going to not be what it was envisioned to be, but for some students it might be kind of a total wash, right? There's the admissions, the admissions pipeline. Most kids coming out of high school are not going to have, or many of them are not going to have grades. They're not going to have the opportunity for extracurriculars that uh, students tend to stack their uh, kind of stack their uh, admissions portfolios with. They're not going to have um, the kind of contact with teachers that leads to recommendation letters. So all all of the infrastructure from the entry and also sitting for SATs or ACTs in the US context. So all of the infrastructure coming in is fragmenting um, and or just dissipating. Um, and then the, the infrastructure that you enter into is if you're a traditional college age student going to a traditional four, four year institution also has fragmented. Also happening at other institutions, community colleges and so forth where you know, enormous numbers of people get there uh, get their education throughout life. You know, we had moved in the U.S. towards a, uh, in some states, free two-year college with the opportunity to transfer to four-year institutions, which is part of the you know original California vision that worked so well until it was defunded um, for political reasons. I think for us to think about, you know, what is the infrastructure we want to make in the wake of this? Um, but obviously, even with the announcement uh, yesterday or today about uh, Pac-10 and Pac-12 sports, I'm not a sports person. I think those are right. Um, <laughs> two of the big football conferences not going to play. You know, hundreds, uh, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue. So you know, there are all through the the kind of business systems of higher ed, even the ones that are not squarely in the education bucket, um, are are being disrupted. Certainly in the U.S., um, and I think we're going to have to reckon with that. Uh, and I think the only way, frankly, for us to reckon with that is federal intervention uh, at some point soon. I think we are gonna probably have to ask ourselves the question, how many institutions of higher ed are we gonna let fail? Um, how many inst institutions of higher ed do we want to survive? But those questions should be driven by what we want as a society. But every single revenue stream, including football about which I know nothing, right? every single revenue stream is being disrupted or destroyed. Um, and you know, so for some schools, then the only hope is for whatever reason, and I don't know about this either, the stock market's still up that maybe donors will still be inclined to give and kind of bridge, uh, bridge to the moment when places can really reopen. But I think we have to ask ourselves the question too, how, do, how should those institutions resituate themselves over the course of that time, right? In the US, for example, the federal government certainly didn't use the pause and we all went, you know, reverted to our houses to come up with real pandemic planning and real, real um, school reopening plans and so forth. Right? So how are colleges going to use this time when they know many of them are going to be closed for this entire academic year, or certainly a big portion of it, how are they going to use it to rethink themselves? Yeah, helpful to have that meditation, uh, Mariko, and so many great points in there about how this is going to disrupt uh, business as usual, but also great to be able to zoom out and say that not every university or college is the same. We're really talking about a spectrum of actors here, um, all of which will, will be affected. Um, so Fred, uh, when we uh, caught up with you last year, you in your talk talked about how the average um, student in, in the African continent has about $1,300 a year to go to college. And you, talk, you gave a great story about how you'd opened up a campus in Mauritius and it was $15,000 when you started and you were able to get the cost down, but actually able to zoom out and think about learning, not just as uh, a single event, but a, a really lifelong process. Uh, uh, you, I think you used the framing um, you know, just in time learning versus just in case uh, learning. And that was really powerful uh, last year to hear that. So I, I'm curious, uh, turning it over to you here, how this is, this, the pandemic is affecting um, your business model, the, the ability for your students to attend uh, university and what other effects are you seeing uh, on the financial side? Well, on the financial side, I think that, you know, this is, a, it's actually a great moment um, for the for society, I'm not necessarily. I'm not sure it's it's, it's, a, it's a great moment for universities because it's going to force universities to do things that they've been dragging their feet on for a long time. You know, uh, they say that crises have a way of accelerating things you've been dragging your feet on for a long time, and that's what I think this pandemic is doing. So, um, you know, constraints really drive innovation, and we have fantastic constraints right now. So it's going to force a lot of innovation and people to really rethink their, their, their business models. I mean, when I look at, um, from the perspective of, um, uh, you know, so, so in our case, we're actually um, going uh, even more disruptive, right? We were already trying to disrupt things and we are using this moment 
uh, where people are a lot more open to, to disrupt even further and to lower the costs even further um, than where we, we were and so that it can become a lot more accessible. But if you think about you know, um, what's happening globally, uh, I believe that um, we need to look at reimagining business models um, in three main ways. Firstly, is how do we reduce costs? We need to massively reduce the cost of higher education. Uh, and I think that can come from unbundling it, right? Because today you have, within a lot of, within one institution, you have a research institute that's trying to create new knowledge. You have a social or country club that is just a place to hang out and grow up and, and, and enjoy working out in fields. You have a sports facility or a sports franchise. You have a learning institution, all of this in the same, <laughs> you know, uh, entity. And customers are having to pay for this, right? And I think that there's, there's you know, so there's some opportunities to, to unbundle and, and, and really think about what does each segment need and then how do you then pay for those, 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 those separately, right? So I think that's one, um, because the, the, there's a very messy cross subsidization that happens in higher education today. And I think that's, that needs to stop and we can, we can be much clearer about exactly what people are paying for. The second thing that, and of course, technology and reimagining pedagogy uh, is also very, very important in reducing that cost. The second thing that needs to happen is you need to think is, is we need to reimagine how we pay for college, especially uh, with uh, respect to students and really explore things like pay it forward models um, where uh, things like income share agreements and, and other models you know, like we are actually um, leveraging a subscription model for, for, for higher education now. So you don't pay for um, upfront to go to our, our institutions, um, but after you graduate and you get a job, you pay a subscription to us uh, for five to 10 years. Um, and, uh, and you engage into, you, you know, um, we've built a, a, a talent agency that's connected to our institution. And when you graduate, you, you pay a subscription fee to that talent agency and we continue to manage your career for five to 10 years, but the revenue we get from that is what funds the education. So you don't pay for it upfront and you are only paying every month when you're employed. So it's a pay for success model. And these are the kinds of things that um, I think, you know, we need to push the sector to do. And then the final thing I would say is to the extent that there's public sector funding, like from governments, uh, we need to move towards more pay for success models where we are actually valuing the contribution of a higher education institution to society. Are you removing people from certain income levels? Are, are, you know, are you reducing inequality in society? Then we pay you. Are you creating innovations and entrepreneurs? You know, are, you creating, are, are your graduates creating jobs for society? What do taxpayers need to justify the investment they're making you and hold the universities accountable to that? And that's, and I think, so these are the three things that I think need to change. I, I love that, Fred, and I, th I think it does take us kind of naturally to my last question, which is, is what does that future look like? And Marika, when we asked you on stage, what is the, we kind of said, what does five years down the road look like and what is 30? And I'll, I'll recap a couple of points you made here. You said, you know, there will be a push to do more online in five years from now. There will be a number of disruptors in the field. We'll see a few mergers and closures, um, but, you know, we, we definitely uh, have to be keep continue to ask who institutions are actually serving um, and are we using tech as a substitute for quality? That was a, a kind of reflection you left us with. As you zoomed out 30 years, you said there's real systems change at stake. There's a lot more mergers. There potentially could be a revival of some of the liberal arts models that, that uh, exist today. Um, but that a lot of this is only possible if, if we really are thinking about um, policy and, and thinking about federal intervention. And you did mention that earlier today. So I don't know if that's a place where you want to start, but, but um, the floor is, is, is yours for thinking about what that five and what that 30 year horizon now looks like for you given, given COVID. How much of it changes, if anything? Yeah, I mean, part of me feels like the five and the 30, it just all collapses into this, you know, this, at this sort of somewhere at the end of 10 years, uh, we may see a lot of those dynamics, some of them are going to move faster. You know, I think the, the, the mergers and closures is going to move uh, faster. Um, you know, I do, I do worry that we will come out at the end of uh, 10 years if we keep using a certain kind of logic. Uh, around the value of higher ed and don't always come back to what do we want for society. We could lose places like uh, um, we could lose visual art programs. We could lose art history programs. Those things actually are essential to the fabric of society. 
Um, and so there's the, there's the jobs piece, which Fred mentioned, which obviously is enormously important and the economic success piece, but these other elements are incredibly important too. Um, you know, I mean, pick your, I won't name any names, but like pick your favorite tech person who dropped out of college, who had they maybe stayed in college, maybe they would have taken, I don't know, an African-American history course. Like maybe they would know a little bit more about, you know, interpersonal sociological dynamics. They might've known a little bit more going in about structural racism, right? So there are elements of the educational enterprise that are about, um, uh, about uh, not just your own self-awareness, but awareness of society and dynamics of society that will make then, I think, you know, better tech, better entrepreneurs, uh, you know, better job creators, and the measure shouldn't just be economic. Um, but we are not, at least in the United States, we're not set up as a society to look at ourselves that way. So one of my, my hopes, maybe it's a vain hope, but one of my hopes for this uh, decade of uncertainty is that we will shuffle out some of those things and start to identify things that are uh, societal and not just economic, though they have an intersection with things economic, um, that are values that we would like to articulate and we would like to advance, which doesn't mean everybody has to believe the same thing. Um, it's not about indoctrina indoctrination, and I think we make a huge mistake when we talk about it in those terms. It's about critical thinking and broad self-awareness and awareness of self in relation to community and society. Um, so I think even as we break up the various pieces, as Fred said, which probably is a, one of the dynamics that I would add to my uh, add to my list. I'll leave sports aside. I'm not going to get into that. But I think you know if we were to think about what are the things that actually should stay together, right? Should you be able to just study computing, right? Should you have to have some sense of um, science, technology, and society, ethics, and so forth? So I think there are some real opportunities to rethink the way that things are stacked. Um, even within curricula, uh, based on what kind of awareness we want people to have when they emerge into society. Um, and I think massive increase in flexibility is the, is the kind of baseline. So whether that massive increase in flexibility takes the form of mergers and stack credentials and closures and so forth, you know, if we were to, to take massive increase in flexibility um, and nimbleness as a premise, then what kinds of structures would we create um, without sacrificing those larger societal goals. Fantastic, Marinko, and it's exciting to hear you do see some silver linings in this disruption uh, as it's well. It's gonna be a while before we feel that. <laughs> it's gonna be rough. It and takes some time, and certainly that echoes some, some of Fred's sentiments as well. But Fred, you, you uh, famously said on stage last year, you said something to the effect of, we don't have 30 years, we have 6,000 days. And you underscored the urgency of needing to really create new a new category of higher ed across the continent. Um, I guess over to you. How, how has um, COVID changed uh, or, or reconfigured your vision uh, for the future of higher ed, and what does that future look like? Yeah, it goes back to what I was saying earlier about how constraints drive innovation. So this is yet one more constraint. We had we didn't have time before. We had a growing youth population. We didn't have resources. We didn't have faculty. So we had to reimagine things. And now one more reason to reimagine is COVID, <laughs> right? So um, I like reimagining things. And um, for me, it's an opportunity to just start again. You know, So one of the things that I would say that in our part of the world, we don't need best practice. We need new practice um, because so-called best practice is in, was, you know, in very often was developed in a very different context, different age. Um, the US and more developed uh, societies were dragging their feet because they had the luxury. You know, yeah, a, a lot of the, um, you know, the, the talk about uh, changing higher education um, was, um, I think you know, people were talking about trends that would hit maybe 20, 30 years down the line. So like, so it, there was no real pressure, but now COVID is, is forcing that to happen much faster. Um, so, you know, as I look at um, some of the reimagining that we're doing, um, you know, to, 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 to think about what, 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 what our education in the future looks like. Uh, there's a few things that I'll share. Firstly, we really believe that um, there's a need to um, go from this um, unimodal way of learning um, to a multimodal way of learning. And what I mean by that is, if you think about how, when higher education originally started, you know, in a thousand years ago, University of Bologna and Oxford, et cetera, and even all the way until 50 years ago, we lived in a world where information was scarce. 
So you had to go to the university to get it from the head of the professor or from the library book. That, those are the only two sources of information, right? It was very, and, the, and of all that, the professor was the main person who had the knowledge. And it was a unimodal way of learning. And today, most institutions are still based on that. Whereas the world has changed drastically. We live in a world where today information is ubiquitous. It's everywhere. So you no longer need to go to that classroom to get it from that head of the professor. It's actually, you know, a child in Africa has access to more information on their mobile phone than someone who was doing a PhD at Oxford 30 years ago. And yet we, institutions haven't recognized that. So from in the way I look at it is, we now have an exciting opportunity to shift the focus of the learning from the professor to the student and put the student there and then let them learn from multiple sources. They can learn from content from the best universities in the world. You know, and you're not only stuck with those, 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 the content that they have, they can learn from their peers, they can learn from projects, they can learn from experts, they can learn from so many different things that they now have access to, um, thanks to, to technology, et cetera. But really saying, build a system, not around a scarce resource of professors, but an around abundant resource of students. And then suddenly that makes it infinitely scalable and drastically reduces the costs. And also, by the way, increases student engagement. The second thing that um, I really believe in is that there's a need to move beyond education to think about how talent is developed and how people become successful in life. And you know, so the Center for Creative Leadership, for example, recently they've done some research trying to understand, you know, looking at people who are successful in life, what are the things that really contribute to their success? And they find that to develop skill in a certain area, only about 10% of it can be learned in the classroom through formal learning and training. 20% comes from what they call developmental relationships with your peers and your mentors and your coaches. And 70% comes from experience. We learn best by doing. But yet today, most of education is focused on just that 10%. So we're unlocking 10% of human potential. And so what we're trying to do is really unlock the 100%. So spending a lot more time out of the classroom, engaging your peers, thinking about different coaches, et cetera. And then more importantly, getting people to learn by doing, right? Through projects and internships, et cetera. So that's the second thing. The third thing I would say is, you know, historically, um, students would come to a university and be given a menu of academic disciplines. Yet, the, I, we really believe that um, to, what we need to be cre uh, creating are not people who have memorized facts and figures, but rather problem solvers. And therefore, what we are doing is giving um, our students a menu of challenges that the world faces and not academic disciplines, you know, history, chemistry, et cetera, because most of the world's big problems are solved at the intersection of, of, of disciplines, not in one silo. And so we, what, you know, in the, the, the way that we think higher education should look is that we should ask students to not declare a major, but to declare a mission. What problem do you want to solve? And then curate your learning around those problems. Um, and then that ultimately develops a problem sol solver which, by the way, I believe is the best defense against artificial intelligence and automation, because now problem solving is always going to be in fashion, even when the computer steals your job. You can, you can just learn new skills. And if you learn how to learn, then you can adapt as the world changes. Find lifelong learning, we talked about that. Um, we need to create a system where you never graduate. <laughs> you enter, but you're always learning. So you get some skills, you work for a few years, you come back, you get more skills, and you're always part of the institution. You never graduate. Um, I talked about new models for payment. Um, and uh, finally, um, I think that we also need much more explicit focus on character and values um, as part of what the institution should be doing. Because today that's seen as, a, it's almost an accidental offering. Yeah, you, you know, it's fine because if you get the character value, but the people who are coming out of higher education institutions are the future leaders of society. They're making decisions that affect everyone in society. So the university cannot leave it to chance that they have the right values and the right character. Um, and especially with technology um, that is you know, increasingly making decisions, we need to make sure that the right values are being coded into that technology in the first place. Um, and so that is another th thing that I think needs to change uh, about higher education. Fred, I love it. And I'm smiling. I'm thinking about students coming back to their parents and saying, guess what, mom and dad, I've never grad I'm never going to graduate and seeing what they say. I'm a lifelong learner and parents are like, ah, um, but there's so much there to unpack, uh, Fred. And, and um, it actually does take us nicely to some questions we've got coming in from the audience, which we'll shift to now. 
Um, if you do have a question and you're listening in, feel free to type it in the chat. Um, and I'll probably take this first one here from Raj. Um, Raj was really excited to hear both of you talking about the goals that society has for education um, and this tension between focusing on the individual and focusing on society. I know this was a topic that you raised, Mariko, in your talk at PopTech last week. Maybe we've erred too far on the individual versus the collective in terms of what we want out of, out of this experience. Um, any additional reflections on this? Is this a false dichotomy, Raj is asking? Maybe Marika, we'll start with you. I don't think it has to be a dichotomy. I think we've made it into one. I mean, to pick up exactly where Fred uh, left off in terms of uh, asking students to engage in, learners to engage in ethics as a process over the, over the lifetime of their work um, and throughout their educations. I mean, I think that the, the, and Fred knows that the frame that he has described of a mission, not a major, of focusing on problem solving and building those muscles as opposed to building a, a you know, in the, in the most traditional version of higher ed, most institutions don't work this way, but kind of building a catalog of facts and information, um, you know, that those, that kind of um, process-based learning, experiential learning, putting the student at the center and all of which is, is also what Bennington is about, um, those, those kinds of engagements with students will actually, I think, by their very nature, to destroy the dichotomy or the binary that's been created. But we have to do it deliberately. I think we have to do it deliberately and we have to do it thoughtfully. Uh, we can't assume that because we put people together, let's say on a residential campus, they will have a sense of community or a sense of social obligation just by being together, which is kind of what we've devolved to in, in broad strokes. And, and Fred, as I let you weigh in on this, I'll add Larry's question to the mix, which is, um, you know, while the intentional articulation of goals is great, he's worried that uh, how, how do we even measure the societal ROI of education um, and capture what we deem good or valuable for, for the collective and for society at large? I don't know if that's something you're thinking about um, with the African Leadership Academy, but over to you for, for how you're thinking about the individual versus the collective, um, Fred. So I don't think, uh, I agree with Mariko, it's not a dichotomy. I think that it is possible to both give um, young people purpose in their life and fulfillment and an exciting ex journey, you know, of exploration and discovery, which is aligned with their mission, with their own personal mission, as well as creating tremendous value for society. Um, and that's why, you know, when we started out, we said, what are the biggest challenges that Africa is facing? And we came up with a list of what we call the seven grand challenges of the 21st century. These are big problems that we have to address, like urbanization, healthcare, climate change, governance, youth unemployment, you know, and, uh, and then we also have another list of what we call the seven great opportunities, which are uh, that low hanging fruit where Africa has been blessed. Things like agriculture, the empowerment of women, uh, you know, um, wildlife conservation. These are all things that society will, is, is benefiting from. And so we said, we want to create problem solvers who are going to solve those problems for society. And we're going to enable those opportunities to, to, for society. And so the, the, the output are people who are hungry, driven, and excited to solve problems for society. And, and they're using this experience to gear up with the courage, the resilience, and the knowledge, uh, and the networks to be able to solve those problems for society. So in that case, you have a fulfilled individual and major problems being solved for society. And, and in doing that, I don't see a, a dichotomy at all. Um, and you know the other question about um, how do we measure the impact to society? I think. Some things can clearly be measured. You know, you can look at um, the you know, number of lives that are touched by innovations that are coming out of, um, you know, graduates from a university or from the university itself. You can look at number of jobs being created by entrepreneurs coming out of it. You can look at, um, you know, feedback from people who are hiring graduates, et cetera. There are some very tangible things you can measure to see whether, uh, you know, the university is adding value to society. But there are also some things that we just have to do on faith and that we just have to know is good for society, like reading history and learning about, you know, racial inequity and things that, you know, um, you can't immediately measure, like leadership, right? How do you value a Nelson Mandela, you know? Or how do you value the cost of bad leadership like we're seeing in some countries around the world today, right? So these are things that, you know, you just, 
cannot put a price tag on and you cannot measure, but you just, you just know they're, they're good. And, you know, sometimes they say that some of these things, it's like love, you can't quite measure it, but you know it when you feel it, right? <laughs> I, I like that a lot. This is a great metaphor. So um, let's take a, a, a comment and a question from Christy, uh, Christy next. Um, uh, Fred, Christy loved your just-in-time framing and um, was really uh, struck by the disruption, Marika, that you outlined, um, feeling like it's so necessary, but also just totally overwhelming, all that's going to be required. Um, so she's curious how the federal intervention can work and at what speed. And so yeah, curious to kind of have Mariko take us deeper on what that could look like in, in the US. And, and Fred, I, I think it'd be interesting to see how you're seeing intervention in the form of, of, of donors and, and other types of financial institutions um, ramping up your work, impacting your work and, and the speed of that. But over to you first, Mariko. So I would say, I think, you know, we, in the US context, uh, which is the only one I can speak to at a federal policy level, um, I, I think, really sent, taking in, in a sense the, the principles that Fred just uh, outlined, centering the student, um, thinking about in new ways, the ways in which we can support students to have a sustainable financial engagement uh, rather than a sustained financial engagement, which is what we have now paying forever, right? A sustainable financial engagement uh, with the higher learning infrastructure um, in a way that actually encourages people uh, rather than what we do now, which is sort of shame them Right, encourages people to engage in lifelong learning um, and really supports that, um, supports that engagement in a robust way. Um, it's one of probably the most effective, um, uh, I'll use this phrase, social welfare programs we could create would be to support people um, to learn and support people to engage in exploratory, um, exploratory learning throughout their lives. Right now, we don't have an infrastructure to do that. I mean, that is, a, that is a, a fundamental financial miscalculation, I think, at the federal level. Um, if we had something like a, a GI Bill that actually was equitable and didn't leave a whole bunch of people out, leave that to the side for the moment, but a GI Bill um, that wasn't premised, for example, on uh, necessarily um, military service, but perhaps national service. Um, and that could be either administered federally or it could be administered by the states. And there are a number of ideas out there that, um, take the concept of student loan forgiveness, um, but build them into, and it may be that for a certain generation, that is absolutely what we need to do because the ship has sailed and they're carrying too much debt. Uh, and by the way, those young people are the people who, uh, you know, for, for those of us who are uh, in, based in the U.S. on this call, you know, they're going to be paying our social security in the current system we have now. And if we keep them down financially, they're not going to be able to pay for our social security. So we should be deeply concerned about their financial success. And we may want to pay up now so that they can support the system going forward. That having been said, there are also opportunities to change the system, like creating a national service um, option uh, that, that genuinely comes with the kind of financial support that would enable somebody to engage in lifelong learning and engage in getting whatever kinds of credentials, uh, to Fred's point about not shaming people, right, to get to whatever kinds of credentials they feel they need to move, uh, to move forward in life. And I'll just pocket out, uh, you know, I have, uh, there's a lot of negative evidence about the for-profits. I think much heavier regulation and oversight of the for-profit um, education industry is also uh, a necessary element of this. And Fred, you're working across many countries and contexts. You spoke last year at PopTech around the challenges and the barriers that you were facing on regulation. Um, how are you thinking about this policy question? Do you have government partners that are, that are funding your model and, and how do you see that evolving? Yeah, so um, one of the greatest barriers to innovation um, has been uh, the regulation, the regulatory system, in because it's essentially been a bit of a cartel, right? Where existing higher education institutions, uh, you know, especially in the U.S., you know, I think they have you have five different regions or something like that, right? Where existing higher education institutions determine the rules of who else can enter the sector. And they decide who gets accreditation, who doesn't. And therefore, there's a natural tendency to entrench the status quo. Um, and, uh, and so, and then in other parts of the world, of the world it's government um, you know, who, who actually decide who has the license to award degrees or not. So that license to award a degree, historically, has been based on inputs 
So a lot of um, you know, accreditation regimes look at things like, how many professors do you have? How many library books do you have? How much land? I mean, in, in, in some countries in Africa, in order to get accredited, you need a hundred hectares of land. Otherwise they will not accredit you. Sometimes they will say, you know, the director's office needs to be five meters by 10 meters and your office is not. So you're not getting accreditation, right? Things like that, which are just so archaic, but prevent, you know, uh, new, new institutions uh, from being born and, and new, new ones. So we need to really change um, the accreditation system from being input-based to being output-based because universities and will respond to that. If you're now being measured on how much value are you creating to society and how are you transforming the lives of, of, of young people and et cetera, et cetera, the things that we actually want universities to do, you know, and how much innovation is coming out of you, et cetera, et cetera. Then suddenly, um, you know, it'll actually uh, enable so many different um, models to be born, which will deliver on that end goal and not be fixated on this one picture of what success looks like. And that I think is a massive thing that needs to change. And I'm going to crusade to change that across Africa and around the world. Um, and, and, and then the, the, the second thing that needs to change are, is, is the way we donors fund, um, you know, um, institutions, uh, you know, historically, uh, a lot of funding that goes to universities is for vanity projects of the donor. They want to see a big building with their name on it or a big, you know, stadium with their name on it. And, you know, this is one thing that is sad about um, philanthropy. One thing I've learned is that donors don't give to needs. They give to their interests, <laughs> right? And so as long as donors, um, you know, feel good by, you know, um, seeing uh, things that don't necessarily um, add the greatest value to society, that, that won't change. But you asked about whether we're seeing some supportive governments. Yes, we are. Um, you know, the government of Rwanda has been incredibly innovative. Um, they're supporting us both financially, but also more importantly, from the regulatory perspective, you know, to really, uh, they've allowed us to innovate. Um, in, in fantastic ways. And, uh, and, and, you know, that comes ultimately from the vision of the president of Rwanda, who's very innovative himself. And so um, what I believe is going to happen is that the Africa and other parts of the world where we have less entrenched interests will actually build the higher education models of the future, not just for their part of the world, but for the entire world, because we don't have the legacy. And so therefore we can actually break the mold and create the new models for the future. I love that. And I'm also smiling, thinking about, you know, the, the Hector example, we all these barriers to get online courses accredited, but you sir have taken it to new heights um, and have much more to contend with, with uh, the placement of buildings on a campus. Um, okay, I want to, I want to leave some time for you both to ask questions for each other. One question. So um, Mariko, I might start with you. What, what question do you have for Fred based on the conversation we've just had that is still burning in your, in your mind? I have so many questions for Fred and uh, he and I will have lots of opportunity to talk. Uh, so I look forward to that. But you know, for, for the purposes of this conversation, I would say, um, as you think about the next 10 years, do you think about it as a time for um, building and or for experimentation? And how do you decide which things that you wanna, you try that you wanna hang on to? And how do you decide uh, which things you want to let go of. It seems to me that this decade is going to be an opportunity for uh, for real experimentation as well as building, but some institutions are going to be able to find that balance and some are, are going to be less able to find that balance, either because they're so used to building or because they you know and don't know when to let go of things uh, or, or because they're risk averse uh, or because they get so far in experimentation mode they don't even know what to hang on to. So how are you going to think about that in the ALU context? Mm, that's an excellent question. Um, the way I think about it is that we, can't, we don't have the luxury of cho choosing between the two. We have to do both. Because in our context, for example, we have um, a goal of developing 3 million leaders for the content by 2035. So if we spend a decade experimenting and not delivering on that, we're not going to hit our goal. And uh, we also have, you know, Africa's on course to become 40% of the world's population by the end of the century. So the reason we have this aggressive timeline of creating 3 million leaders is because we ask the question, who's going to lead 40% of the world's population? And you know, we said, we're gonna tackle that challenge. We said, we're gonna create a, the leadership capacity, 3 million leaders for 40% of the world's population, right? So it's, 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 a, it's an urgent goal and we, don't, we, we cannot 
experiment without delivery. Uh, now, that being said, I think that um, many organizations around the world have shown it's possible to both deliver a product and continue innovating and experimenting. So I think that uh, we need to, we as ALU need to keep innovating and experimenting, but universities are around the world, the next decade should be a period of massive experimentation and innovation. Um, but while continuing to deliver, because we can't ask young people to wait for 10 years, um, they need futures. And so um, the way I think about it is that uh, understanding the core of what um, young people need to be successful in life, but then having um, constant experiments that are going on around that so that you can um, define and manage, limit the blast radius of your experiment in a way. So, um, you know, it, and it, could, it could mean things like one cohort goes through a certain experience for, but another cohort doesn't, you know, and then you can learn. Or, um, you know, you test something in the first year, but you leave the second and third year a bit more traditional, et cetera, right? So these ways you can continue to, you know, for, for the, fa the factory continues to run, but you're running all these tests and then you're learning and then using that to embed into your, your, your future delivery. Great. All right, Fred, now is your chance to ask uh, Mariko a, a burning question that you have, and then we will turn it over to Letha uh, to give us the, the summation and the framing for our conversation. But Fred, over to you for your a hardball question for Mariko. Thank you, Nick. Uh, Mariko, you heard me uh, earlier um, express my frustrations about accreditation agencies and how they, they stifle innovation. I know you um, were, the, were formerly on the board of one of the accrediting bodies in, in the US. Um, so from your experience there and what you know about accrediting agencies, what's it gonna take to change um, the bodies that are really setting the standards and creating the incentives or where higher education goes? What's it gonna to take to change? Yeah, so uh, first of so all, I was on the uh, New England higher, edu higher education accreditation body. Um, and one thing I'll say is, you know, you pointed out that there are multiple regional accreditation bodies. Now this is obviously in the US that um, they're very different. There, you could argue there are some upsides to that. There are also some downsides to that, but they're very different both in terms of how they're run um, uh, in some cases, what they're looking for and who they put on the accreditation body. And it's that last one where I think, uh, at least based on my experience, is the enormous difference maker, right? If you, if you put people on the accreditation body um, who are innovative thinkers, who are uh, interested in stretching the limits, who aren't hidebound by the existing structures and the existing status hierarchies, and that's really important, um, then I think you can have accreditation bodies, and I think uh, New England, I'm biased, but I think New England did the best job of this, of the, of the regions. Um, you have accreditation bodies that are willing to experiment with institutions and really are engaged with institutions in supporting those experiments, not financially, but supporting the thinking of those experiments and being flexible in their own thinking around how the accreditation uh, standards can be met in a wide variety of ways. Um, I think if all the accreditation bodies had that as a remit, um, then that would be that would that would make some uh, significant change. But so much like everything else, and we can talk about systems and structures and institutions till we're blue in the face. They're all made of people, right? It's the people who are in the room uh, that matter. And uh, I think for too long, most accreditation bodies have been very narrow in their thinking uh, about uh, who gets to be in the room, what kind of credentials and perspective you need to be in the room. So the kinds of questions that then get asked of institutions when they come up for accreditation and, you know, can be thoughtful, creative, engaged, or they can be rigid and bureaucratic and arcane. Um, so, so much of it depends on people. And I think sometimes we forget, you know, I, I, can't, I can't speak to the, you know, the kinds of regulations that you mentioned about, you know, your, your office has to be, you know, five by 20 or whatever, but, you know, if somebody has the power to change that, should they so desire? Right? Should they not feel that their ego or their power or whatever or their own personal status is attached to their ability to like come with the tape measure and measure your office and then shame you, right? So I think we have to remember that these are, uh, these are organizations that are peopled. And every institution, every entity, every rule, everyone, you know, other than maybe gravity, right? All, those are all created by people and we can change them. 
We just have to sit, decide that that's what we want to do. And I think it's easy to kind of reify them and say, well, they float over here, uh, rather than thinking through the peopled systems um, and how people can be moved to change them, uh, sometimes just by changing the people. Yeah, I'm, I'm snapping over here on my screen in approval. It was so much wisdom, right, Fred? Yeah, both of us, everyone's snapping over here. Um, Letha, with, uh, with a minute or two we have left, uh, if you can give us your, your take uh, on this amazing conversation we've just had. My uh, usual mode of operation here is to say, uh, I'd like to put forth a call to action um, because I think that you're both touching on some really f important issues. And I would uh, hope, and it's part of PopTech's DNA really to inspire collaboration between uh, its key members and community. And I would really hope that you two find some way to join forces um, to, to formally think about this notion of the future of higher education. I, I mean, I think we're sitting here with two amazing architects and I'd kind of like to put you guys on a retainer to, uh, to think through the next 10 years. I, I mean, you're both already doing that. So I'm, my, my biggest hope and call to action is that you somehow find a way to combine those forces uh, and uh, make some real magic happen. All right, friends. Well, listen, thank you. Uh, big thank you to Fred and Mariko for this amazing conversation. And, and thank you to all of you who watched live and who are watching the recording. We are going to have this available um, if you want to come back and rewatch it. Um, and hopefully, Letha, we'll come back in uh, 2021, PopTech, maybe 2022, PopTech in person sometime and reprise this amazing conversation yet again. Fabulous. Well, I'd like to thank everybody. Um, for their time. I know it's late for Fred, um, and I, I happen to know he's been going pretty much all day long. Um, and Mariko, I'm just delighted you took time out of your busy day to join us as well. And I'm, I'm banking on 2021 for PopTech in person, so there. All right, thank you all, and Thanks, uh, with gratitude. Yeah.